Meg, are you on mute? Okay. Can we unmute her? I don't know how. She has to do it. Okay. Oh, you're good. She's good. Good evening and welcome to the Thursday, January 3rd, 2019 regular meeting of the school committee. We have just returned from executive session where we met for the pur purpose of discussing strategy with respect to school safety and because having the discussion in an open meeting could compromise school safety protocol effectiveness. I would ask people present in the audience to please rise to say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And to the republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So, we'll start out. If anybody has any recognitions before we dive into all of this, um, I don't have any other. I actually just have one. Okay, so, go right ahead. And it just cropped up only a few hours ago. Um, in going from 2018 to 2019 with payroll, they set new tax rates. And somehow, there were some issues with how the pay, paychecks went out um, just recently, so that some paychecks went out short, $35, $200. And I just want to thank all of our partners on the town side for being able to rectify this in probably the next 48 hours. I think it's just really important that our people in January post-holidays are, are made whole. So thank you to them. Thank you. So it, it, any public comment? I don't know. Uh, we don't have a robust crowd, so we could come back to that if people come forward later. Uh, and we do not have student council reps right here. If they come, we will take that out of order down the road. Uh, and we will wait on the superintendent's budget recommendation for some of our other town partners, because we're a little bit ahead now, and move into the school committee chair report. And I have approved for payment the accounts payable warrants 19-062. 19-063 and 19-064, all warrants have been included in your packet. And I have approved for payment the payroll warrants S19013 and S19013A. Payroll warrants have been included in your packet. Um, and then again, the school committee office hours we didn't have not had since our last meeting, but I would like to try to set a time uh, before the public hearing next week. We can probably do that offline. So I send a couple. I have a couple of dates. I'll send around, and then we can hammer that out and hopefully get a listserv out um, before the end of the week. Are there liaison reports that people have? I'll make a quick one. Um, so the website subcommittee has not. <laughs> sorry, I don't know what's happening there. It hasn't met, but I did want to um, let people know that uh, Mr. Ghosh and his team have actually reached out to vendors who are now in the process of responding and will be scheduling, um, I think mid-January, we have two dates that we're looking at to schedule vendor presentations. So the ball is rolling and we are looking at, um, you know, what our options are for the new district website. So, great. Thank you. I have none. It's kind of embarrassing. I will. New Year and the holiday and all. Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess that moves us into uh, new business item A, which is the 2020. Wow, that seems weird to say. 2020 International Travel, and it's just the intent to travel. Hopkinton High School Europe World History, Mr. Spiegel, and that's you. Uh, yes. So we have a request for your approval uh, for students who are taking either world history, U.S. history, AP history, or facing uh, history in ourselves. So students in those courses would be eligible, um, up to 40 students, to travel to Europe, places like London, Normandy, Paris, Munich. Uh, and they would be going on April vacation in 2020. They would be going with um, EF tours, and we always use them for our trips. They're very reliable. Um, and you can see in your packet, you know, the ways in which that connects to the curriculum. And it's Mr. Spiegel who is sponsoring that tour. So we are looking for your approval. I, there's, there, one thing jumps out at me with respect to the fundraising that it. Uh, I believe that EF Tours, and this is not noted on this one, but it is on a different one, mm -hmm. has the ability to set up uh, fundraising pages to help students with fundraising, and they also do have some scholarship money that is available for ki kids to apply to that should be noted in the material. Yes. Before it comes back for a final. Okay. 
Yeah. Other questions, comments? Anybody want to sign up to Chaplain? <laughs> I wish we could. Mm -hmm. Okay, then I would, if there are no questions, and I. I she shook her head. She shook She's her good. head, yes or no? She's, She's good. trying to keep okay. track of you, Meg. I would then uh, seek a motion to approve this initial, uh, approve the Hopkinton High School grades 10 to 12 intend to travel to Europe for April 17th through 26, 2020. So moved. It's a motion by Jen. Second. Second by Mina, and we'll do a roll call vote because we have remote participation. So Aye. Amanda is Meg? Aye. Yes. Aye. And I am also a yes. So that is great. Thank you. Uh, and then we can go down to item B, which is the 2020 International Travel Intent to Travel Hopkinton High School English, which is Ms. Martin and Ms. Breen. Yes, Marie Martin and Samantha Breen uh, would like to take students to um, a number of cities, Berlin, Prague, Krakow, Budapest. Um, and you can also, again, see the connection to the curriculum in, in your packets. Um, it looks like they are looking for anywhere between 12 and 30 students. And um, at this point, there are some of the pieces that still have to be um, determined. Oh, let's see the number of students and then the return the departure and the return dates it looks like those aren't there yet you know typically those will come when ef tours books the flight and the hotels and those things so they usually have a, a rough sense of, of when they're going and obviously this is just for initial approval and again it's in 2020 so and the only thing that i want to know is that we are approving the potential in this intent for school to be missed depending on the flights it would not be a significant amount but it might be a and again, the same holds true about the fundraising. So I think I it's actually noted in this one. Mm -hmm. I knew it was noted yeah, in one of them. This one. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, so then I would seek a motion to approve the 2020 International Travel Intent to Travel Hopkinton High School Europe English, Ms. Martin, and Ms. Breen. So moved. So motion by Jen, second by Meg. Meg. By, by Meg. I see, I can see it all. And we'll do a roll call vote again. Aye. Meg? Aye. Yes. Aye. And I'm a yes as well. So that's great. So I think at this point, um, we're ready to go back into the superintendent's budget recommendation. If that's okay. Do you want to just do the ice hockey trip? Oh, do sorry. I, more? I skipped over I that think. one. Yes. Let's just do that just for okay. keep that. Yeah. It'll just keep it going. Okay. So this one is pretty easy one it's just one single night uh, overnight the boys hockey team will be traveling to Martha's Vineyard um, they will be uh, they have been invited to play in the 21st annual Fairley Dickinson hockey tournament on the vineyard uh, there are three chaperones uh, Chris McPherson Scott O'Connor and Paul Kirk and um, it looks like they will be going uh, on February vacation leaving on the 16th and returning on the 17th Questions or comments on that? No. Okay, then I would seek a mo motion to approve the boys' ice hockey overnight travel to Martha's Vineyard for February 16th to 17th, 2019. So moved. Oh, motion by Jen. Okay. Second. Second. By Nina. And then a roll call vote, Amanda? Aye. Meg? Aye. Yes. Aye. And I am also a yes, and so that also uh, passes. And then. We'll go over to you for our uh, budget recommendation. Budget, okay. So I've prepared a presentation for tonight to talk about the um, FY20 budget. As you know, we started out and let the principals just put everything on the table, things that you know were probably their greatest wishes. And at that point, we were at 9.9. .9. Um, I will give you the spoiler alert that right now we are at 6.67, but I will talk a lot about how we got to that place. So in the process of creating this budget, there were many things that were, in fact, important to us. Um, as you know, we have really great academic and extracurricular programs in Hopkinton. And so one of the things that we all agreed on was that we had to maintain the level of excellence that we currently have. Um, the curriculum and instruction that we are offering to kids needs to meet the needs of every learner. So students who, you know, learn differently, students who are your highest achievers, students who struggle, students who need remediation, any, any child in the Hopkinton Public Schools should be getting what they need. 
Uh, we obviously needed to add a lot of teachers, and we had to add a lot of teachers in FY19 and in FY20 because we needed to accommodate increases in our student population. Um, I know that I say this almost every time we meet, that we had about 200 more kids this year than we anticipated having. Um, it was a, certainly a shock to to our system, and I think that we've done really well this year bringing in the appropriate personnel so that we are offering kids good programming and just solid curriculum and instruction. Uh, we obviously have to work on our facilities. Um, some of those facilities are going to need some a little bit of expansion space, um, but I also think that we continue to look at our facilities and think about where sort of intensive programs are going to be or silence labs are going to be, and so we try to maximize our learning space. We're constantly looking at uh, student safety measures, so we have cameras in place, we meet very frequently with um, the school safety and town safety personnel, and all of that takes place. Um, we will continue to build technology programming in FY20. There's not a whole lot of that going on, but we do, in fact, have you know licensure to worry about, machines to upgrade. And this year, Marathon Elementary School is actually one-to-one -one as well. Every student you know, in those classrooms, there are 20 iPads for every classroom. And finally, this budget uh, does, in fact, support all of our school improvement plans. So along the way, there were some major challenges. I mean, obviously, increasing enrollment was one of those challenges. Um, I think I had been talking to members of the school committee several weeks ago, and I had said, we are in a very good place. We're probably about $75,000 away from hitting that uh, 6.5 mark. And then we got some very bad news from Accept Transportation. Uh, one of the people who is what Susan Rothermick would call a market mover in our collaborative uh, decided to step out of special education transportation for this year. And what that meant was all of the other districts who were remaining in the collaborative were going to have to pay a significantly higher cost for special education transportation in FY20. Uh, for some districts, that meant $400,000 added to their budget. For us here in Hopkinton, it was an additional $200,000, and it took us by surprise, and it probably happened to us within, I don't know, the last month. So um, it's been very hard to figure out how we were going to trim yet another $200,000 from the budget. Uh, when you opening, open a new building, you know that costs are incurred with that process. So, for example, at Marathon, because there's so much more space, so much more open space, we are unsure at this point what heating costs are going to look like through this winter. So we're kind of, you know, in that place where we've budgeted an amount. We're not sure if it's too high or if it's too low, but it's the best guess that we have right now. Um, obviously, we need more maintenance personnel in a building like that because the driveway is so much longer that we need people to remove snow in a much greater area. There's more grass to maintain, all of those things. Um, and there were programs to create. You know, so as much as we would like to say maybe we could keep status quo for a year, that's not feasible. Um, the state has given us all new social study standards. So when you get new social study standards, we have civics that has moved into the eighth grade um, and adjustments to be made at other grade levels. We have a new math program, K to five. And when we, when we look at, by, at these new programs, part of the reason that that happens is that we have licenses for textbooks, and when those licenses expire, we say, are we currently using the best product available? And if it's not the best product, then we go out and we look and we do an evaluation to see what it is that we want to adopt. Um, either way, we're paying for, for new textbooks. The question now becomes, how do we implement this new program and get teachers K-5 to trained in a brand spanking new product? Um, so those are just two quick examples. Uh, we have, because of our increase in student enrollment, we also have growing transportation needs. Um, what that means now is that we talked about this a little bit last time we were together, is that we have hit bus number 29. We do have MAPT, which is the Mass Association of Pupil Transportation, coming in to do an audit for us. And for a very low fee, they will look to see if we are using our busing as efficiently as possible. So that's, that's something that I think, you know, is just good housekeeping, really. Um, and then, of course, you know that we have unfunded mandates that we have to fulfill. So somewhere between our first presentation when we were at 9.9 .9 and today when we are at 6.67, uh, we had to go through um, sort of a lot of reductions and a lot of eliminations. And this is never easy. Um, I can just tell you a little bit about how the process looked before we go through that, that bulleted list. But we have had 
one-to-one -one meetings with our, our building principals so that I'm sitting in the middle school or sitting in the high school or sitting at Hopkins with those principals and really talking about what their programs look like and what their personnel look like. Um, but we have also corralled all five of our building principals and the three of us, um, Jen Parson, the assistant superintendent, and Susan, the business manager, in a room at central office and we did that more than once and when we get into that room we're probably in there for two almost three hours and it's never pretty you know and we're kind of taking a look at are there places where we can move people are there different ways for us to um, sort of strategize around the people that we have now and can we share them are there things you've asked for that they're just untenable and that conversation goes on for a very long time so while it might feel to the public like we were here several months ago looking at 9.9 .9 and miraculously we're at 6.67 none of that has been miraculous it's only come really through rolling up our sleeves and hard work and a lot of sweat and tears so some of the things that are gone, and this is probably not the full complement of everything that is gone, but we did eliminate um, a 1.0 FTE that was asked for at the high school. Um, Mrs. Parson had asked for a K-5 to math coordinator, and at this point we're thinking about hiring somebody to do that at 0.5 as opposed to having a 1.0 FTE. Uh, we have eliminated a requested 1.0 FTE um, in special education. I know Dr. Zaleski was looking for a special educator at the high school, and we looked at teachers' caseloads there. Uh, the highest one for FY20 is 23. There are obviously some that are very low. Um, but the reason that you get very low caseloads in special education is that it's somebody who runs a particular program. So if you run the 18 to 22 program or an intensive needs program, you're obviously just dealing with students, you know, that fall under that, that category on that umbrella. Uh, we have eliminated a 1.0 FTE maintenance worker. We eliminated two technology positions, and the two technology positions that we have eliminated are the um, requested webmaster and a technician. Um, let's see. We have reduced a 0.2 benefits coordinator request. So currently we have someone doing our benefits at um, 0.7, and we're hoping just to bring that person's uh, role to 0.8 for next year. We had a reduction of support staff requests overall. We had 2.8 in support staff, and we have reduced that to 0.6. There has been attrition, and that's actually been really helpful to us in this process. Um, and it's helpful to us in this process because as you look at those bullets in the gray box, one of the things that was really important was preserving people's jobs. And sometimes as people decide to retire or resign, we are able to move people into sort of vacant spaces um, where they, they may have not been able to um, continued employment, have continued their employment with the Hopkinton Public Schools. Retirements are also helpful in the sense that when someone retires, they've been along, around a very long time, they are paid at the top of the salary schedule. And in the event that you're able to replace that person with a lesser paid person because they're coming in at the very beginning of their career in teaching, that's a really sort of wonderful way to save money. Um, and we are grateful to those people who have given all of this time to the Hopkinton Public Schools. I wouldn't want them to think otherwise. Uh, so we have restructured some personnel. We have had some very small reductions to our expense budgets. Um, I think most of the people uh, in central office and the secondary principals were able to shave $5,000 each. And we are also going to be able to use some Title III grant monies for our English language learners. So that will be helpful to us. All right, so talking about some of the difficulties um, and this may continue to be a, di a difficult situation. So on Aug October 4th, you know, we have our October 1st SIMS data. You can see how many students were enrolled in the Hopkinton Public Schools. We were at 3,740. The day school began, we were at 3,721. And currently, we're at 3,756. So since the very first day of school, we've had 35 new students come into the district. And that was as of December 20th. Interestingly, I think since we got back to school, we've already had three more kids join the district. So at the bottom, in the call-out box, where it says our anticipated growth between now and next year is 103 students, we've already gotten three of those. So we're looking at 100 kids. 
full disclosure, this entire budget is built on those 100 students coming into this district. And it's also built, and this might be the most important thing I say this evening, it's also built on the even distribution of those 100 kids. So across all of our grade levels, if we get seven, eight, nine kids in each one of the grade levels, we're going to be fine. We have the plan to absorb those children into each one of the grade levels. You'll remember that this year we had surprise grade levels. In kindergarten, we had 64 unanticipated kids. In grade six, grade eight, grade nine, we had great big numbers. Um, so much so that we actually had a whole class worth, like 30 students in grade six. That's an awful lot of students. If we see that same phenomenon again this year, we are going to be back to this table thinking about how we are going to um, acquire more staffing to be able to accommodate kids in those grade levels. So that 100 or 103 or wherever that number is sort of is fluctuating today, that's a really important number to us. The last column on this is the NESDEC projections. And even NESDEC at this point does not really know into what grade levels students are going to land. So when you have 100 kids coming into your district, you know, even distribution is the goal. This is what they are predicting. Um, and you know that we have also worked with um, Beth Deliva, who uh, has a business in town that sort of allows her to see who's moving into the community. And I think that when we talked about her numbers, they're probably not so far off. Um, you know, I'll go to this slide first, just because it will sort of help you see those numbers. Um, if we take a look at the numbers that are based on developments in the community, in column E, you can see the estimated occupancy um, by June 2019. And what we've done where you see the yellow bar at the top is we have taken out um, any of the age-restricted housing. So that has been taken off, and it comes down to 132 single-family or condominium units that will be available prior to or by June of 2019. What that means is you would have 132 students if you had only one child on average coming from every one of those households. In the previous slide, I had illustrated that 35 kids are already here. 100 kids are our guesstimate for coming in. If that number isn't, doesn't sustain that we have more than, on average, one child, then, you know, again, we'll be back to, to this table thinking about how we can increase our staffing. Um, if we had two children, for example, you'd be at 264 kids. So how does that enrollment growth translate to... Um, our need for FTEs, or full-time educators. Every time 20 kids come into the district, it, it takes about 1.4 teachers to teach those kids. So when we looked at the number of sort of surprise students we had this year, we had 50 we were counting on, and we had 139 we hadn't been counting on. So if I round that up to 140, we have seven groups of 20. So what we needed really in this year, in FY19, to accommodate that growth would have been about 9.8 full-time teachers. And that can mean a second grade teacher, it could mean a special educator, it could mean a librarian, it could mean an art teacher. So, you know, when you get a second grade teacher, we also have to figure that that kid's going to specials and may need remedial services. And so every single thing that you see there, it's about 1.4 FTEs. So the budget that you see here tonight was built on our 1819 numbers plus the 103 kids. Now this is one of those slides that I think is also important for taxpayers to be able to see because I know how much the school budget costs the the town as a whole, right? In most in most communities the school budget takes up the majority of the towns um, budget. And, you know, Hopkinton is no different. But if you take a look at um, some of those very top communities, and these are the per pupil expenditures, and they came from the DESE website, and they are the 2017 per pupil expenditures. Districts like Weston and Dover are play paying somewhere around $20,000 per student. Um, Weston, you know, obviously close to $24,000 a student. Here in Hopkinton, we are still at like 14,500. So I think that families here are really getting a whole lot of educational bang for their buck. We do an awful lot. 
Um, and, you know, really it's, I think, our classroom teachers who are exceptional instructors that get us to a place where our kids are so high achieving on, you know, sort of a, a very modest, I would say, per pupil expenditure. So that, that's a lovely slide right there. And the other thing that I think about those numbers right there are those are the 2017 numbers. You know, if we looked at the FY19 numbers, those numbers could actually go down given the vast amount of kids that we have absorbed this year um, with so few faculty additions. And just to sort of show you that, you know, we really are doing a pretty good job with our kids uh, in any one of those cells that is colored green, our students, according to MCAS rankings, are in the 95th percentile or better. So third grade at Elmwood for ELA was 97, fifth grade at Hopkins, 95. Um, math at the middle school in grades six, seven, eight were 96, 96, and 99. The eighth grade being in the 99th percentile for math is an amazing score, absolutely amazing. Uh, and then you can see that uh, the white is anything that is in the 90th to 94th percentile. So that would be grades 4, 6, and 8 in ELA, and grades 3 and 5 in math. And then we have those two boxes up there that are colored peach, and those are the ones that fall into the 80 to 89 percentile. When Mrs. Parson says that she feels like we would be well served to get ourselves a K-5 to math specialist, you can sort of see some of the data there that's helping with that. And you know that um, Mr. Keller has talked about adding reading um, across the sixth grade so that every student now gets reading instruction still in the sixth grade, uh, which should hopefully help with the 83% in um, seventh grade. So I think that one of the things that this slide also illustrates is not how well we're doing, but how we are taking our budget dollars and trying to apply them wisely in places where we see need for student growth and achievement. All right, and then, you know, I always like to show our Hopkinton High School accolades. Um, you can read through all of those, but we are uh, 18th statewide in the SAT for reading and math. 89% um, of our students earn a passing score of three, four, or five on over 1,100 AP tests. That is an enormous number of AP tests taken here, and those are darn good scores. 100% uh, of our students earned proficient or advanced in the ELA MCAS last year. 97% of our students earned proficient or advanced in the Math MCAS in 2018. Uh, there were very few high schools named by the Commissioner of Education as schools of recognition, and Hopkinton High School was one of four of them. And then finally, Boston Magazine uh, puts Hopkinton High School in the top 20%, but the top 20% among the best public high schools in Massachusetts for 2017. So there's an awful lot to be celebrated. All right. Okay, and now we get to the number portion now of we the get show. To the number portion. Um, so, with that said, as you know, um, back in September, um, we had received guidance in terms of what would work financially for the town for all departments, and the school. Um, our guidance was a 6.5 percent increase. So we continue to march along to um, achieve that number. As you can see right now, we are at 6.67. There are still some budget items that are in play. Um, for example, there are some out-of-district placements uh, that Dr. Zaleski is working very hard with families that may change um, in our favor. And the other piece is that except transportation um, assessment is still being discussed by the board at accept um, because as you can see that's a large number for a lot of these districts to absorb in in one budget year so we don't know if that will play out but it's one of those numbers that's still up in the air so and I think just to be clear on that number I don't think the number is going away but it might be mitigated to some degree it, right it yeah. like 200,000 won't go away but they may decide to you know, ease the burden by maybe everyone getting 10,000, you know, so it's not going to be a huge change, but it is a number that could potentially change, so. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Forgot my job. <laughs> I should turn. Um, so this slide is, ju is just one that we always show uh, for illustration, really just to remind everybody that the um, budget is 80% is salary. 
Um, so you, as you can see, when we're making changes, a lot of times it does become personnel. Um, as students come in, it's personnel that we're adding. Um, and, you know, trying to meet guidance, typically it affects personnel. So um, while we did give uh, a directive to pretty much level fund expenses across the board as you're, you know, looking for that zero-based, try not to, as you're, as you're building, um, you know, the direction was don't look for more. Um, so that, that was a directive right off the bat. So, and again, that's just for illustrative purposes. Um, as Dr. Kavanaugh spoke earlier in terms of what has happened during this year. So the increases that we have had to add for in FY19, that will be carried over into FY20. Um, at the secondary level, there were 4.6 FTEs. There were two EL English learner um, FTEs, one campus aid. Special education pair of professionals has been six. Um, we've actually reduced one learning specialist at 0.5. And the teacher for visually impaired is increased by 0.3. Uh, library increased by 1.0 with a corresponding reduction of library assistant at 1.1. So what you, what you don't see in here are positions that were added this year that are not being carried forward into FY20. As a, for instance, we added um, regular education paraprofessionals to Marathon. It started with four. Uh, just coming into a new building, class sizes were increasing dramatically, so that sharing of one paraprofessional to two classrooms was not working. So we added those four right off the bat coming in. One in a couple months uh, was already reduced and switched to a special education paraprofessional, so we went from the four regular ed down to three. Um, but none of those three regular education kindergarten are carried forward. That's why you don't see those here. So the only ones you see here are the ones that are being carried forward, okay? So the personnel that are being added in FY20 is 1.6 elementary teachers, 1.0 secondary teachers, 0.5 adjustment counselor, five special education paraprofessionals, 1.5 math and ELA coordinator slash coach, 0.5 secondary nurse, 0.5 elementary library, a 0.6 administrative assistance, maintenance 1.0, and a benefits coordinator at 0.1. Um, and just as a reminder, as a for instance, at the elementary level, um, that increases at the marathon. So that consists of one first grade teacher but then you get at the, the related um, 0 0.05 of music, 0.45 of art, 0.1 of wellness. So it gets back to that kind of 1.4 teachers for groups of students, um, just to give you an, an idea. Um, all the other positions you have heard, the presentations from the, the buildings as to those needs. And again, some of those needs have been cut back um, from that earlier slide, you can see where, as a for instance, the secondary teacher request was two. All that's being put forward is one. Okay. And I think something interesting to point out there is just the 0.5 secondary nurse. You know, when you start to see a 0.5 secondary nurse, it's just because of the increase in student enrollment. Correct. There are so many students now that, that we actually need an additional half-time nurse. The personnel decreases, so as we, you know, continue to constantly look um, at not only what is needed, but how can we restructure. So if, um, you know, if we can look district-wide at that district-wide level and move staff around, what can we gain um, to be able to absorb this? So the decreases will be the 1.0 literacy coach, uh, half of a cut to an assistant principal, the library, at uh, middle school at point three, we are reducing a guidance secretary from 12 month to a 10 month position. We're reducing one English language learner teacher and again using that grant money, the tutor. So again, just a different structure to um, trying to achieve those same goals. 
reduction of a special education learning specialist and a special education coach. Um, and again, these are all, you know, hard decisions, um, but we have to continue to move forward to what the, the guidance is, being able to make things work, but also still trying to keep um, the cuts away from students and really focus on direct student instruction. Mr. Uh, the ones that you just shared, so these are ones which we already have, or are these adjustments from what was proposed? These are uh, positions that we already have. Okay. And where is the literacy coach? At what grade level? So that is She's elementary. Okay. So that is that restructure that we talked about of putting in place um, the coordinator, the ELA coordinator and really looking at that K to five um, uh, curriculum alignment. So this is, again, a different model to bring about better, uh, a, a different structure. Thank you. So this is just uh, taking all those slides and, and putting them together into one slide, um, just to give you an idea of a, a one snapshot basically the same thing of what you just saw on those previous slides. So given the increases in FY19 and the decreases in FY19, the total is about 750,000, and given the increases in FY20 and the decreases, it's about 424,000, so 425. Then the last piece, of course, are the changes in expenses. Um, and again, the message was, where possible, to level fund. Um, where you are stuck, of course, are contractual obligations. Um, so you can see technology, the um, increase was minimal. Central office, that increase really is transportation. You have a $60,000 contractual increase and the addition of a bus. Um, most of our buses, especially at the middle school, high school level, are at capacity. Um, the original, what we had originally put in the bus, in the budget was two buses. So we're taking a chance and we pulled one, one back. Um, curriculum, as you heard Ms. Parsons discuss, was the textbooks for six through eight math and eighth grade civics. Athletics, that is really the contractual obligations for transportation. And what you heard Ms. King talk about was just the increase in number of games because all our, teacher, all our um, teams are now getting to post-season, the number of games have increased, and that is a, that's a contract in terms of what we have to pay for um, the transportation, and the officials comes from the MIAA. Regular education, again, each of the buildings did a great job in really kind of holding the line in terms of what their increases were. What you really see were changes where they needed to buy furniture for classrooms. So as we look to get creative with space, you need to outfit them with furniture. And that's really where you see a majority, um, that's really a majority of what that increase is. Building and grounds, uh, what we talked about again was the utilities. So in this year, we used a one-time rebate that was transferred to salaries. Um, so again, that utility cost didn't go away. We just were able to use that rebate. And again, we increased the estimate for gas for Marathon because it is something that we still don't have any experience on. Um, so while that is you know, an estimate and it's something that we'll continue to monitor. Um, extraordinary maintenance, as you remember last year in 19, we, were, we pulled a lot of our extraordinary maintenance out and we put it in the capital plan. Um, and that was advised <coughs> by the, the town manager. Not that these extraordinary maintenance projects go away, they continue on an annual basis. So that's what these, um, that increase reflects what is needed for next year, such as um, water testing, replacing bubblers that are not working, um, the concrete entrance to the middle school that is crumbling. So all of these are things that, that need to be addressed. Um, and also in there is the increase in rent for central office. So again, contractual. Um, occupational day, we're just seeing increase in enrollment. 
that's what that number reflects. Special education, this one again gets a, a little bit, um, just to re remind everybody that we did a transfer to salaries of 300000 of that prepaid transportation. So again, that transportation number didn't go away, but we were able to move that prepaid up to salaries. So that number is part of that increase. While it looks, um, it's deceiving, I will, I will say. Um, and then we talked about the assessment increase of over 200000 tuition increase of 183000 and assistive technology um, was an increase of 11000 Our homeless transportation was another increase of 15000 So there are a lot of pieces to that, but again, you know, a big piece of that is that chunk of prepaid that was transferred to salary. Ms. Rathamish, what is the occupational day? That are kids that go to um, Norfolk Aggie, Keefe Tech. Why is it called occupational day? Just curious. What the state calls it. Hmm. Vocational education. Thank you. Ms. Rathamish, mm -hmm. oh, when we're looking at the athletics or the buildings and grounds budget, um, expense numbers. Was there any um, offset from the current turf field from rental income that might come through the turf fields that might then apply? Did we budget that in? Like I know with the buildings and grounds expense budget, when Mr. Pearson presented it, he said it had accounted for facilities use and I think parking fees that help offset that budget. So I was wondering if there was any similar projection now that we have the new facility. So turf, turf field is not part of the operational budget. So all the money that is raised through the turf rental is kept in that account um, for future replacement of turf fields. Okay. So that was not money that was ever meant for us to be used in an operational budget. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, but usually uh, any rental fees that we may be getting through our facilities, where is that kept? So that is. So okay. regular building rental, um, we have an offset in there of 100000 I see, but just for turf fields, we have a... Turf fields is completely separate. Because of the phases that we have set up, is that the reason? So it was an agreement, and that was how it was um, put together at town meeting. Okay. So it's a cooperative agreement between Park and Rec and the school department in terms of running and maintaining and future replacement of that field. Um, so all the revenue is to be in that special revenue account, mm -hmm. it is not to be used for the operational um, school budget and it is not to be used for the operations of park and rec. So it is strictly earmarked for the future of that field. Thank you. Um, how far off we are we from a dollar number uh, with the 6.5 recommendation? So Sorry. we're about $75,000 away. Oh, what was your question? Sorry. Um, I was just asking about the dollar number. Uh, how much did you say? I'm About sorry. seventy-five thousand. Okay. Thank you. But if I'm understanding correctly, some of that seventy-five thousand may come back to narrow the gap a little bit through either the negotiations regarding the the collaborative, and also some if we have any of our out of district students who may come back in district, we could appreciate some of that savings there. So we correct. So hypothetically, it, it, could end up at 6.5. We could end not. up at 6.5. I would hesitate to make additional cuts, whether it would be staffing or to expenses, if we can answer that. Um, so, and we have an obligation according to, um, you know, what the school committee needs to do in order to have their public hearing and vote right. to move forward where we are. Yes. Things will continue to evolve as they do. So we'll hope that things continue to work financially in our favor. Is there a timeline for the Accept Collaborative to figure out what they're going to do for the four schools that are still left in there? Um, there is not a timeline. So at this point in time, where we are is where we are. Uh, it, would, it would be for them to come together and make a decision on any type of mitigation. 
Now keep in mind the Accept Collaborative is several school districts, but only a portion of those school districts use the transportation. So any type of mitigation that they want to do from other financial resources would be of concern of the um, districts that do not use transportation. So it would have to be a collaborative vote to decide that that is the direction they would like to go. Um, and there really is no guarantee, and you can understand both sides of, of the story. Okay. Yeah, I think we last met with them on December 18th. Hi. Dr. Zaleski, Mrs. Rodmick, and I. And I think at that point they had given the superintendent in Dan Goodigans. Need him. Need him. Need him. The charge of coming up with sort of a master plan, but there was no official timeline. Okay. I think Meg has a question. Mm -hmm. You're on, Meg. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. So I noticed that the great. Can we turn it up here. a little bit, please? Well, not, we're having trouble hearing you, Meg. One sec. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Go ahead. Um, is in special education. And so I'm curious if the number of special ed students has dropped um, or what is it that allows us to decrease that number? I mean, we're increasing paraprofessionals, but that's very different from a lay specialist or a sped coach or a literacy coach. So I can speak to that. Um, the paraprofessionals who have been added, they have been added because a student has a requirement on his or her IEP that says that they have to have a one-to-one -one or two-to-one um, situation with a paraprofessional. Um, so that's why we have added those in FY19. And in FY20, what we're looking at are the number of students who are in sort of intensive special needs programs um, to some degree. So some of them are those programs. So for example, if there is a teacher who is in the intensive special needs program and has I don't know, six or seven students there, it may warrant um, the addition of a para. So we're just looking at those numbers there. But the actual teachers, when we eliminated the special education coaching position, that person will go back into the classroom as a teacher. Um, what has happened as we have looked at the teacher to student ratio at the elementary levels, so for example, at Marathon, Elmwood, and Hopkins, um, we have had a couple of resignations, one of which we haven't been able to fill. Um, and when we had that resignation in the uh, K-1 building without being able to fill that position, I mean, it's been posted for several months, but at that point in time, the special educators there were able to absorb the caseload of the 0.5 um, FTE who resigned. So a 0.5 position is being eliminated for next year at Marathon because we feel like we have enough special education um, teachers in that building to be able to accommodate the number of students on IEPs. Um, and of course, we are monitoring that. I mean, obviously, if you have an IEP that dictates that you have a particular number of minutes of services every single day, I mean, obviously, we would never be out of compliance. Um, and then the same thing is also true at Elmwood and Hopkins. Uh, we have had a resignation at Elmwood, and through restructuring, what that would mean is there would be a 0.5 reduction at Elmwood and a 0.5 reduction at Hopkins. So the other piece, you know, as we've had discussions, um, you know, not only with the building principals, but also with the town manager and, you know, the, uh, the board of selectmen, the other side to this equation as we lay people off is the unemployment. So we're, we're being cognizant of that as well. So if we have a resignation and we feel we can restructure, it doesn't also then cost the town on the other side in terms of unemployment. So it's, you know, this is kind of a win-win without being a win-win. So if we, can, if we can figure out a way to make it work, rather than have a list of layoffs at the end of the year, it's, it's a better way to move forward. I have one other question kind of along those lines. So you mentioned that we're not carrying forward some of the um, kindergarten paraprofessionals who were brought on this year. Um, so I, 
I don't know how to ask this delicately, so I'll just put it out there. I, so next year, we're going to have kindergarten teachers without a paraprofessional. Will then there be a need to find paraprofessionals next year, given the class sizes that are going to be, you know, one teacher to 22 kids or 23 kindergartners? So we're not carrying forward this year, but are we going to then need to rehire them next year once we figure out how many kids we have? So when we went into <laughs> FY19, the thinking was that we would have one paraprofessional for every two classrooms right. and we would be able to share them. Um, with the additional 64 kids in kindergarten, we felt like we had two choices. We could either bring on another teacher to lower class sizes or as opposed to totally dismantling the schedule and moving kids out of classrooms where they had already been assigned, it might have just been easier to add those four um, paraprofessionals, gen ed paraprofessionals. So that got us to almost equal, right? So um, the other piece that was, I think, pretty convincing was the fact that we had people who were going to um, be in a building for the first time and dismissed from that building for the first time. And it would be a rival and kids would be wandering around a very unfamiliar place. So, you know, we thought bringing in those paraprofessionals was, was wise. And, um, this year, it's our goal to meet that same target of going in with one paraprofessional for every two teachers again. And some of the, I guess, um, things that will be a little bit easier this year is the fact that now we know how to do dismissal, we know how to do arrival, the kids are familiar with the building. If we can sustain class sizes where they are, we will hopefully not be at 22 and 23, but as you know from this year, there is no guarantee of what class sizes are going to look like, especially in those funny class um, areas like kindergarten, grade six, grade eight, grade nine, right? Those are just the, the difficult ones. Do we have projections? I know that it's really hard to project class sizes given that we don't know where our big hits are going to come or if it's going to be evenly spread. Are we anticipating class sizes smaller than what they are currently in next year's K? Yes. So what, what NESDEC has done this time around, and I think that it has been, um, I hope that it will prove helpful, they worked very closely with Connor Deegan. And what Connor showed them was the census data for four-year-olds over 10 years. And then what we looked at was we compared the census data for four-year-olds over 10 years with the number of students who actually enrolled in kindergarten in Hopkinton. And consistently, it was somewhere around 80%. So that was sort of helpful data, so that if we realized we had 80 kids who were on the census, then 100 kids showed up in our classrooms. Um, so this year, the number that we have is based on that census data. Hopefully, it will, it will hold. But you know, at the same time, it's hard to say, given you know the the slide that shows you how many residences will be ready for occupancy by June of 2019. Yeah. Best guess. We're, that's right. We really are just working with best guesses. We've applied a little bit of science, as much science as we think we can, to it. I, I want to, before I rush ahead, do are there more questions on the presentation? from our side here. No. Okay. Then I do want to invite um, our partners from the town if you guys want to have questions or if you want to come up to discuss any of it in more detail. You want to come up, Claire? No. Oh, sorry. I thought you were raising your hand. <laughs> I thought you were raising your hand. Uh, No, the last thing that I, I will say, and I'm not sure if they're watching, but I would like to thank all of our building principals and all of the directors. Uh, it, it was a grueling budget season, and we've all come out on the other side, and we might be a little worse for the wear, but I think that they've worked really hard, and I want to thank them. They've been amazing. I, likewise, I want to thank you and your entire team for putting a lot of uh, elbow grease in here. And I know you guys were working right through uh, through the new year, right up until the last possible second to 
get the best numbers we can uh, and to get it as low as we possibly can. I know that our teachers and our personnel are our greatest asset. I appreciate the effort that went into preserving our current people without having to turn over uh, and the creative look at restructuring things where possible. So. I just want to add on that too and, and just say that when you look at like the slide with the personal decreases for this year and you see a principal giving up part of an assistant principal and you see um, you know another principal giving up a guidance secretary that's kind of shared with the office secretary um, it says so much about I think our administration and the way they keep children at the center and the I think you've worked really hard to protect children facing positions and um, I just commend you on that, finding the efficiencies and, and doing this difficult work over the last month or so. Thank you and thank you to your staff. Yeah, they're great. It shows. And for finding the Title III funding to help with some of that, I know that's always nice to be able to have some. HR department. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's, uh, I will say when we first started out before we looked at how many kids were coming in and the challenges of the enrollment, the challenges of the except collaborative, it, it seemed in the beginning like 6.5 would be much easier to hit than it turned out to be. And it, it looked, you know, a month and a half ago like it would take moving mountains, which essentially you did, uh, to get us down to where we are now. So kudos to all of you. Um, and then our next step for people who are watching along is we will have a public hearing uh, next week, uh, next Thursday, um, here. So that that will, and then we will have another week before we will look at all the feedback we have received and look at the recommendations that have been made and vote to advance our budget to the uh, town manager's office. If anyone is interested in the stepping stones to get us yes. all the oh, way to thank town you. meeting, <laughs> yes, yeah. when we post this, you'll be able to see it. I just have, um, you know, similar thoughts. Uh, this is the first year, Dr. Kavanaugh, that you're presenting this along with a fairly new team. Um, you know, last year was my first budget season, and I come to realize in the past year and a half that I've been on this board that this is not easy. It's a complex job, understanding the needs of our learners and trying to meet them. You know, I see, uh, you know, requests for... Um, on one end with regard to safety, on another end towards travel, international travel. We see English language learners, we see special needs, we see children who are, um, you know, who are advanced learners, if you will, um, all kinds of needs. And keeping all of that in mind and presenting a budget is not easy, especially with a lot of unknown. Um, and I know you're placing a lot of faith again in this deck. I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but uh, I, I think it's not easy, is what I have come to realize. So I, I appreciate very much what you have done along with your team. I'm also very thankful to our town, um, our taxpayers, for their generous 6.5% increase. This is not the case in many towns. So very, very thankful to them for that. Uh, of course, the growth... Uh, is one of the reasons why we are getting to where we are getting. But hopefully we will continue the quality education that we provide in our district through the support of quality leadership and quality teachers. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. Uh, I think we're ready to, we are ready. to segue into our next uh, item of business, which is item D. Uh, under the new business, which is Solar Opportunities with Ms. Rothman. Thank you. Um, so as we continue to march along uh, budget issues, we've been approached with two opportunities for solar. Um, you know, as anything we can do to reduce things and expenses that don't touch students is, is a great opportunity. Um, so one of those is to add additional panels to the Marathon uh, building. As you know, as part of the Marathon project, there is a small amount of solar panels on the roof that exist now. Um, so this would be a proposal to look at the remaining roof uh, areas and where else can we add additional solar panels, again, to offset our utilities. Another opportunity is to actually get into a net metering um, opportunity for a solar farm that will be built outside of the town of Hopkinton. 
And so we would be buying those net metering credits from solar that is produced off-site, and that, again, would help to offset our utilities. Can you just um, – I had a little difficulty understanding some of the packet, I have to admit, on the solar. We currently – do we have solar panels on the middle school still, or do we We remove? have solar panels on the middle school and the high school. Yeah. The, the thing that you always want to bear in mind is when you put on solar panels, you want to understand what the age of your roof is. Right. Um, so Marathon being brand new and the roof being brand new is an opportune time because then the life of your panels and the life of your roof coincide. Yeah. Um, so we do have some panels on part of the high school and part of the middle school. I would not look to add to those roofs at this or add panels to those roofs until we replace the roofs right no i was more curious about how, what kind of agreement we have currently so with the yield from those panels mm -hmm. what what happens with that do we get credits is it more like the first option that you talked about it is where we get credits on our bill it is yes Are so they productive? you can there's um several ways to do solar if you mm -hmm. will um what is what exists now at marathon we own yeah. because it was purchased through the building project okay. um, a lot of times mm -hmm. with solar to avoid that capital outlay you go into what's called these power purchasing agreements yeah. where they own it yeah. and you get the credits and then you buy their solar for less um, so you still are able to offset but you don't have that capital outlay the capital outlay is typically the stumbling block for most communities right. to, to increase solar. So the, the diagram that showed for Marathon currently, it had one area that was black and everything else was blue. Is the black area where we currently have the panels? Yes. It's a very small percentage. Very small. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So here's a random question with this. There's, there's opportunity to save a pretty significant amount of money. Mm -hmm. But I guess I didn't quite totally understand what we would have to lay out before we saved that money. We don't lay anything out. We don't lay anything out. All right. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> All right. So, you know, there's, there's incentives. There's reasons why developers do what they do. Um, so for the solar panels, as a, for instance, that we own that are on the marathon roof, mm -hmm. we're able to sell what's called SREX. Um, so the town right now currently gets the revenue from those SREX. So the developers that are coming in and they're doing this, they're getting revenue as well. So they own the panels, they're getting the, that SREC revenue. We're getting the utility offset. So when you own them, you get both. So right now, the, that little piece that we get that direct offset on our utility bill, and the town gets to sell the SREX and gets money into the general fund. Okay. So, but by us not putting out that capital outlay, we don't get that, that revenue. We get the utility offset. All right. So, yes, there is incentive for, for developers to do this. Okay. I also just want to highlight, because I imagine that when people here were looking at solar things, this could come up in the community, that the my understanding from you is that the technology is different in how they're being installed, and that the problem that we had years ago um, with the panels that were installed in the high school, that damaged the roof. That couldn't happen with the way they're being installed now. That's correct. So the, the solar, pan, solar panels and solar installations have come a long way since the time that it was installed at the middle school and high school. That installation actually has roof penetrations. This will not have roof penetrations. It's what's called ballasts, so they're weighted onto the roof, and they also work with the roof manufacturer to make sure that the warranty will also um, be honored at the same time. So they will work together with the, the, the roofing contractor. Um, so it is a very different situation than what we have currently at the middle school, high school. Excellent. Is it possible to do both of these, to do net metering and expand our solar installation on Marathon, or are they mutually exclusive? No, nope, I'm looking for both. Okay. Mr. Rathamik, how long do you think will be this investigative period? 
Um, so the the net metering is is a build. So this is a company that is looking to get um, uh, nonprofits, schools, to invest to you know take part and buy these credits. So they're looking for that to be built potentially at the fourth quarter of 19. Okay. So. Um, and then the installation on Marathon could take a couple months because, again, they'll do their engineering studies. And so um, when I look at the memo, what you're seeking is permission to investigate. Permission to um, negotiate and sign agreements. Uh, I think we need to restate the motion, probably. I think that's in the motion, yes. It, yeah, I think it does so negotiate. in the memo it says, I'm looking for authorization to negotiate in good faith for Hopkinton Public Schools for each of these projects. So what I have in here is the motion to, to approve the Director of Finance to investigate solar opportunities with solar agencies for solar opportunities for facilities in the Hopkinton School District. Yeah, the motion is different from the memo. The memo that she submitted is different from what the motion says on the agenda. So we we want to make sure we go with the motion that is in the in memo. the memo. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So what you're requesting. Any other? Uh... So on the net metering, this is a new build. Is it a company that has done this before? Do we? Is this a common? It's um, very common. Okay. Yeah. So I mean. You've probably driven around the state and you see solar farms. Mm -hmm. That's that's where these come from. They work in this kind of arrangement with yes. either nonprofit or private clientele. Yep. So they'll they'll put solar farms in communities that will allow it. You know, with the uh, the zoning and, and planning within that town, and they look for um, people that would be off takers. I, I must admit I was under the impression that this is simply an investigation that you are looking at. Um, so I'm just wondering if we are authorizing that you move forward with some of the work, including uh, the work on Marathon Elementary. Um, I'm not an expert in this space, so I'm just wondering, um, you know, do we have any kind of a protocol of folks in town who, who may know this, who, who are partnering in this? So the, the one for Marathon is being proposed by Select, so they are our town partner. Um, okay. They are currently doing our preventive maintenance on the solar panels that currently exist on Marathon. We've signed an agreement with them to do that. Um, so Select has done many, uh, is working with the town on, on other uh, ones as well. I believe they were involved at um, I don't know if it was the firehouse or somewhere else where they're sure. also um, managing. Okay. So are we guaranteed to get some benefit out of this in terms of savings? Yes. So what are the risks? What are the risks that we don't see, that we don't, especially with the net metering that we don't currently do? We currently do the other, but we don't currently do net metering. Is there a risk? So there's so the only thing that would happen is um, on a cloudy day where it does not produce as much, you don't get as much solar, which means that we also don't pay for it. So we won't be billed for anything that the solar does not produce. So if it's if it's down, if it's covered by snow, um, and it's not producing, we're also not being billed. So we pay our regular rates to NSTAR. Correct. And we don't pay that portion to the solar provider. Right. We pay a higher percentage to NSTAR. It just means that our bill would not be reduced right. by the solar, and we would also not pay the solar company. And they don't, they, have, they don't, they probably can't. I don't know enough about this industry, but the rates are set. So the rates aren't different when you're a solar partner. The standard rates, I mean, they don't, like, ra the rate the that rates comes high. from NSTAR is, is the, the rate, rate that comes right. from, yes. Okay. That doesn't change. It's a direct offset onto your bill. Um, and Ms. Rothmick, do you have to go through the planning board by any chance for any of this work? No. Other questions down there? Want to make sure Meg's okay down there? Meg, do you have any questions? No. She's good. No, I'm good. Okay. Uh, 
if that's it for questions and concerns, and I want to make, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm seeking a motion for authorization for the Director of Finance to negotiate in good faith for Hopkinton Public Schools for each of the two solar projects uh, outlined as outlined in the agenda. So, so moved. Motion by Jen. Second. Second by Amanda, and we'll do a roll call vote again. Start with you, Amanda. Aye. Meg? Aye. Jen? Yes. Lena? Abstain. And I'm a yes. So that's uh, four yes and one abstain. It's just to clarify, I would like to spend more time understanding this. Okay. Okay, then that brings us, uh, I'm going to flip back here, to the budget transfers, which is also um, Ms. Rothenberg. Thank you. Um, so this is pretty much a follow-on to the financial report that I gave to you in December and where we had, um, you know, salary adjustments through staff moving, through attrition and everything that we talked about. Um, this is really kind of cleaning that up and making the budget transfers to reflect the actual of where staff are. Um, so the first five, six, seven, and eight is to clean those up for staff that were moving. And then the budget transfer nine, you'll see that shift um, between our out of district placements in terms of mo the movement of private to collaborative tuitions. And that's just really based on, on student needs and, and where our students are at this time. Any questions, comments, questions? Concerns? Okay. Uh, and then, in absence of any comments or questions, I would seek a motion to approve the budget transfers as outlined in the submitted documents in our agenda packet. So moved. Motion by Jen, second? Second. Second by Mina, and we'll do a roll call starting with Amanda. Aye. Meg? Aye. Jen? Yes. Mina? Yes. And I am also a yes. So that moves us into uh, old business and we have uh, item a school committee policy jlb financial assistance this is a second reading uh for and dr kavanaugh you're going to present that i will and yes i just want to say i did not re i saw that it went out uh on the listserv i did not receive any feedback i don't know if you did none okay no. yeah we talked about this in november and one of the things that's going to be happening very soon is we are going to be um, going through the you know whole Chromebook purchasing process. And as we looked at this particular policy, what we realized was that th there were a couple of things that were sort of outdated here. So you see that uh, you have a redlined copy in that second section where we talk about fee reductions or waivers. Um, the Tuition for full day kindergarten was still on there, and that obviously made no sense because um, we now have free full day kindergarten for everybody here. Um, but so we left in pre K tuitions that that's still there, um, and or we added in free pre K kindergarten. Uh, but the other thing that we have taken out of there is. Um, financial assistance or fee reductions for the one-to-one -one laptop user program. And that's not needed any longer because right now what we will do is any student that doesn't have one or can't afford one, we just give them a loan for the year. And the kid just, you know, takes it, comes and goes with it, and it's just very easy. So those are the two things that are, are relevant to, to now um, and removal of one outdated item. And then if, if I recall correctly, this also... Uh, Denise Hildreth took a look at this as well, is that? She did. That's what I think um, kept us from approving this last last time, yes. And typically we wouldn't be looking at policy during budget season, but because Chromebook and laptop is coming up, it's on the horizon, sure. there was a, a need to expedite this. Any, uh, Really just housekeeping. comments. I know you guys, your policy group has been so uh, proactive. <coughs> Excuse very me. very quiet the last several yes. meetings, but we'll get I loud again. I don't think you've been quiet in the background, though. I'm going to guess you guys have been continuing to move forward. Okay. Um, then if nobody has any questions or comments on the policy, I think we are ready to actually um, approve it. 
So I would seek a motion to approve. I have to look at the letters to make sure I get this right. To approve, motion to approve policy, school committee policy, JLB financial assistance. Um, looking for a motion. So moved. Motion by Amanda, a second? Second. Second by Mina, and we'll do a roll call starting with Amanda. Aye. Meg? Aye. Jen? Yes. Yes. And I am also a yes. Okay. So that passes, and that uh, brings us down to our next uh, opportunity for public comment. Uh, we are public is yes. <laughs> very lacking here. <laughs> um, uh, hopefully people are able to tune in from home, though. So that brings us then down to uh, items by consensus. Yes. So as superintendent, I recommend that the school committee vote to approve the items by consensus as outlined in your agenda. So moved. Motion by Mina, a second? Second. Second by Jen, and we'll do a roll call. Uh, Amanda? Aye. I think we may have lost Meg. I think we lost Meg. Okay, so <laughs> we've got Amanda. She's um, gone. <laughs> Jen? Yes. Mina? Yes. And I am also a yes, so the items by consensus have passed. And uh, I would, I guess at this point, seek a motion to adjourn. So moved. Okay, motion Second. Again. Second by Mina, and since we no longer have uh, remote participation, we can like do simple. <laughs> All those in favor say yes. Aye. 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 So we are adjourned uh, at 8.15 p.m., and we will look forward to our next meeting uh, next Thursday, January 10th, 2019, at 7 p.m. here in the high school library when we will have our public uh, hearing on the budget. Thank you all, and have a good night. <laughs>